Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming here uh, for our fourth student lecture series of the semester. Our guest tonight, uh, Jack Oliva Rendler, who is uh, currently director at P7 uh, Architecture Studio. And prior to that, he's received the uh, undergraduate thesis prize from his uh, alma mater, Southern California Institute of Architecture and went on to uh, get a master's degree from uh, Harvard GSD and also received the award from NASA in urban design in the Mars City design company. Uh, a lot of this uh, pertains to uh, radical data infrastructure for Earth observation science and environmental analysis that's kind of an interesting uh, space for uh, architects uh, uh, yeah please get up back to the um so I just want to start by saying thanks so much to uh, all the students for having me here, uh, taking the time to listen to me, and thanks to um, you know everyone for being a part of this. Um, this is really exciting. You're all part of my personal history now. It's my first professional lecture. So, um, so the title is um, "Eco Eco Computational Architecture." Uh, we'll go through a definition of the what that means. Um, I suppose, um, well, Ben told me, I was told to start with a statement um, about where I come from. It's a bit poetic. Uh, more importantly, I think is where I've spent a significant part of my life uh, in a dimensionless space uh, that spans infinitely in every direction where there is no air or gravity, there's a limitless supply of matter with no actual um, properties from which I can assemble architecture. There's no material like uh, density or weight. It is a pure space distilled to the properties of geometry and geometry alone. In deep meditation, it, a deeply focused state of mind, I interpolate the assembly of lines, surfaces, and points into structures that infer the construction of worlds. So I'm starting with this uh, sentiment about the nuclear bomb when Robert Oppenheimer invented it. He said, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, and I really believe architecture has the ability to create life, sustain life. Um, I hope to become the creator of life, a creator of life, not the creator, but a creator of life and a creator of worlds, um, or maybe be like the creator of life, if you will. Um, and so there's a method to doing that. I've, I've been trying to look at uh, ecology as this concept of a life-giving environment, and then how, how does one deconstruct, reconstruct an ecology through computation, through architecture? So to start with the definition of ecology as an interconnection between organisms and their environment, um, or interconnections between components of an environment, how they form a system, and then what, what is computation, right? So uh, calculations, algorithms, formal systems, arrangements of information as a formula in a procedure. It's a composition of variables as interdependent systems or equations. Um, so cognition, you know, we're in this age, the, the sort of dawn of AI as the assimilation of information into a structure. Um, computation sort of performs in all these ways. Um, and then I see architecture as an assembly of units that pertain to a whole. Um, 
So architecture and computation are actually rather similar. Uh, and so that it's the configuration of interoperable components of the whole through constructs or constructions. And so we, we construct uh, these sort of calculations of the ecology, if that makes sense. Um, so this is, this is what I'm talking about in terms of addressing how to decipher ecology, decipher the earth, or create a legibility of the earth through computational tools. On the bottom right and left, you'll see this trigonometric equation or geometry, which is how satellites read the earth to create dimensional elevation maps. So they'll triangulate points along the surface of the earth and create uh, the terrain maps you see on the top left. That's a type of LIDAR scan. To the right of that is the first ever photograph of the earth from space, um, which I find a really powerful sort of um, perspective to look at our built environments, our natural environments, and then to live in a certain time where humans very obviously have a great impact on the environment. And then what does that mean for us as architects to have a certain uh, collective authorship over our environments and uh, you know how we're treating the biosphere and each other uh, collectively as a, as a type of terrestrial architecture, if you will, or terrestrial system that we're designing. So we have a whole tool set with NASA's Earth Observation uh, System, Earth Observation Data Infrastructure, where the Earth is sort of encoded into a cyber infrastructure. Uh, GIS, uh, Geospatial Information Systems, was um, sort of uh, began its genesis at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design and now allows us to essentially take our built environments and reconstruct them as data sets. Uh, so you'll get location, what's called location mapping systems of every school, sort of hospital, agricultural site, industrial facility, commercial spaces. You get a whole programmatic analysis of what's happening in the environment. Um, and you could kind of categorize and color code these things. And these are manipulable sets of data. I like to call it a datascape. Um, and so there's within government databases across um, the United States, around the world, these geospatial information systems are becoming very prevalent. Uh, common, some are more private and public than others. And I think they become the most legible way where we become familiar with what are the social programmatic functions of our built environment and what, what are the e ecological functions of our environment also. And when they're brought into a, a digital modeling space, that's our opportunity to engage uh, sort of ecological systems, social programs at the scale of the environment which is radically different in a history of architecture that pertains to a singular parcel. Um, and this is where I see the future of architecture being is in this sort of larger scale um, consideration of infrastructure, uh, sort of large cultural programs that are aggregated or arpeggiated throughout the env environment. So the environment can be like an exploded axonometric diagram parsed out into these multiple layers and becomes the sort of new uh, canvas for architecture, I would say, where you could isolate transportation systems, parcels, uh, social programs or cultural programs. Um, and then essentially what that is, is a context model. Each time we do a studio project or an architectural project, we're reconstructing site models. Um, I suppose I propose or rather see that inevitably we will have iterative context models that are continuously iterated upon and shared between architects so that we'll have a continuously working sort of environmental simulation of our cities and architects will be collaborating within this um, sort of digital simulation space where the city's maintained through uh, something that's going to be in between building information modeling and geospatial inf information systems. Um, 
Okay, so uh, you, you can cartographically uh, parse the layers of the city into what's on the left, which is this high fidelity map, you know, which could be exploded into layers and then diagrammatically, schematically uh, come in to identify certain key points. Uh, what we're looking at here is a map of uh, Watt, uh, which is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, which um, has sort of the lowest income and a really high crime rate. And then we're identifying the main cultural facilities within that location. Uh, so the schools, the libraries, the museums, the child care centers, and creating a type of green space that connects between them. Um, and I see this as really important because this is becomes how we uh, sort of address uh, the the culture and the sort of social phenomena happening within an area and the biosphere as well. Uh, there's maybe a certain scope of impact a singular building it can have, but when you're uh, calibrating and integrating 26 to 30 projects within a targeted area, they begin to collectively have impact on the way people live, and how they relate to the earth. Um, and this is also, so you can infer from what I'm saying that this is about architects working together within a shared context model, multiple projects happening and simultaneously sort of in a type of interoperable space so in Los Angeles, I went through um, sort of some key neighborhoods, targeted areas, uh, color coded in a map, the snippets of, of these areas. Um, and so we, we will walk through a few of those. Um, so here you can see there's a lot of sort of industrial sites and commercial space, um, actually not much. Uh, housing going on in downtown LA, so it's this sort of industrial mecca. These, it's it's on the surface appealing to have a color coded map. It's the sort of colors and uh, symbols begin to tell a story, a certain narrative, or um, exactly what's happening inside the space. So you can see where Skid Row is, where most of the homeless are. Those are all the of shelters or community services clustered in one area. Um, this is uh, Santa Monica near the coast, lots of uh, residential space and then huge commercial corridors uh, with the 10 freeway meeting the coast um, and a few, few schools sprinkled in there. This is Hollywood, uh, industrial and commercial space and then sort of housing aggregated in there. And so what, what this lends us to is the possibility for you know, uh, scripted algorithms or uh, parametric computation um, using the computer to manipulate data sets or an analyze existing point clouds or point systems coordinates uh, key locations and their relationship, how uh, resources and essentially energy is migrating and moving through the environment. Um, so this is a triangulation of all those major cultural centers in South Los Angeles and, and using a procedural method to create green space between all of that. So you would have a reforestation project of all of South Los Angeles in a schematically diagrammed way. And from this 2D schematic plan, you could imagine these uh, field algorithms being projected onto these cityscapes. So this is a magnetic field from Grasshopper using attractor points and repulsion points, to create a type of field of correlational geometry that would uh, begin to interact with a point cloud. So there's sort of two uh, two topics being thought of here. On one hand, we have the environment being assimilated into a datascape, and then on the other side, our ability to generate geometric fields, geometric algorithms that have the potential to become architecture. And um, this is a process that I've diagrammed where 
we call it virtual community action planning at East Devon Architecture Studio, where each community can sort of go through a sort of templatized process. So it begins with GIS and the assimilation of um, a template of data for each community um, addressing their key programs and infrastructures, uh, identifying you know, what are the native plant species, where are people living, uh, how do people move within that space, and essentially doing an in-depth site analysis that becomes shared amongst the community and the community engages with that data set, becomes shared amongst them and is within the neighborhood council. And then that becomes um, three-dimensionalized and of service to algorithms that with AI or the intelligence of the architect can project onto those uh, site analysis models and begin to do sort of larger scale, more integrative conscious design because all that information about the community is there. The community is contributing to these data sets. Um, they're having input and voices about what are their needs and concerns. Um, and the earth too also becomes a parameter variable and driver for these algorithms to interact with. And then at the end, um, these built environments can be put in game engine simulations where um, you can occupy them, explore them, interact with your friends inside them. And it's a, a real sort of digitization of our communities. And then we sort of interact with those communities as an interactive modeling process. So this is what a virtual community action planning laboratory might look like. Um, there's certain uh, envision centers being deployed right now um, from the housing and urban development branch of the United States government, where they plan to teach STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEAM. Um, to the communities, uh, I would advocate, E7 Architecture Studio would advocate um, that these digital tools, this virtual community action pro planning process becomes protocol for how each of these communities manages their development. Uh, so people are working together within these laboratories, making collective decisions and deploying um, how multiple projects correlate between each other inside this space. This becomes the new creative uh, sort of laboratory for the community to interact with architects and city planners and sort of visualize the future of each respective community. And so at, at the end of this process, when with some foresight, we can imagine each community having a digital twin or some type of presence within the uh, internet. And you could call that an instance. If there is um, a digital twin for each major city in the United States or around the globe, or um, a simulation of a city, and we have to assimilate, assimilate and organize these digital twins and environmental data sets into something that's navigable, I see that happening in uh, Web3, a spatial internet interface. Um, so we essentially would create a virtual world that would allow you to portal between all these community models, community simulations, make, make commentary on uh, each community and how they're developing. Um, and then you would also have catalogs within that virtual world of different architectural studios, institutions, um, their catalogs and databases. And then what the phenomena that occurs is a, is a virtual ecology where you have um, on the first layer portals into these digital twins. And then on the second layer, sort of architectural catalog. And then on the third layer, resource materials with building materials, vegetation indexes, sort of climate information libraries of algorithms and building technologies. And all of this can and will be aggregated in a virtual world that we're building called 
to connect this Terraforma platform. Um, and sort of the, uh, that, that's gonna be the official ecoverse of building in the metaverse parking solutions for the real world. Um, it's a virtual eco world building platform made for architecture firms, engineers, contractors, developers, and the community. They uh, work with uh, to display and sell designs, materials built together and interact in an ecologically focused and gamified space. So this, this becomes a type of gathering space for people within the virtual world. Um, there will be uh, showrooms where architecture firms can display their designs, sell blueprints, you could maybe do research in this virtual world. Uh, and then there becomes this proximity phenomena where there's lots of design intelligence existing in proximity to each other within a shared gamified space. And you could exchange ideas in this platform and uh, essentially have access to large data sets and earth simulations and um, whatever information you're willing to share and your friends are willing to share and have this type of exchange of content. And it becomes very eco-driven because the environmental data being collected by geospatial information systems um, is present. Uh, you have the vegetation indexes, the hydrology maps, the geology of the earth. And um, you're also combining that with uh, high-tech tools of uh, tokenization and blockchain and AI, which will have a cross-referential system to sort of analyze how these multiple simulations are relating to each other. So it's a whole sort of virtual, virtual city where these interactions are going to take place. Um, also be exhibitions. Um, architects can exhibit their work. Um, you, the archives and our, uh, sort of catalogs of bodies of work, particular architecture firms can be uploaded. That's a certain service we want to provide. How do you create a spatial exhibition space within the virtual world for um, architects? And that becomes a type of uh, space that you could draw upon. Uh, firms become global. This is a, a sort of global virtual world platform where um, people can log on and access uh, and see the, the work that's going on in these different architecture firms and see the community developments that, that are happening around the world. And, and as we have seen this concept of, of a, a web free internet, that is spatial and no longer text-based is the future. And um, it's important as architects, we have an in-depth approach to how that's going to affect our, our practice. Um, I don't necessarily prefer the term metaverse um, for the term web three, it's simply spatial. Um, so, um, It becomes an interactive ecoverse for designers. Firms and designers can upload their models into the Terraformer world and are able to play their work and simulations. Um, there could be a strategic partnership and collaboration within this virtual world. Um, and, and then there becomes this incentivized means to share work and become cooperative within uh, this sort of project to essentially do the ecological restoration of the planet. Um, so uh, local residents will be able to learn about infrastructure of their cities via digital twin simulations, build their own structures on tokenized land plots using assets provided in the platform. Uh, gamified tools and simulations would help teach and inspire architecture students or those considering the profession. Uh, virtual community action planning and similar integrations are planned for subsequent phases of the world function expansion. Um, so I, as, as I was uh, conceptualizing this virtual world um, over the course of the past, let's say eight months, six months, I found that the method of constructing a virtual world 
and what might be the method of constructing a world in uh, sort of an environment space in any major city would be slightly similar. Uh, topography as topology, as a sort of parametric equation could be scripted and landscapes could be generated on which you could build a virtual world, just like in um, the actual physical world, you could have a dimensional elevation map of a city. So you can use erosion algorithms. This is not a real landscape. This is a this is an algorithmically generated live landscape in um, a program called Gaia Quad Spinner. Um, and um, I, I find I find this sort of paradigm of algorithms being collaged or assimilated or interacting in certain ways very promising. Um, and it, what's also interesting is you could uh, draw in a type of procedural way where you're working through a procedure, which is like a process, which is like a method of calculation. So within a uh, perspectival grid space, um, these striations of lines are projected off the grid and then become interrelated or interpolated between each other. And so the relationship of landscape to these geometries um, becomes very powerful. Abstract geometry, I believe, becomes the tool in which we manage complexity, sort of drawing these uh, fields that have an underlying system that governs the way in which these geometries first and aggregate. Um, if we're going to do environmental scale design, we have to do sort of tool-based or, or sort of formulas um, uh, essentially methods in which we have control over multiple layers of complexity and how those layers relate to each other and become three-dimensional. Um, so these are um, sort of cubic systems that are aggregating, uh, assimilating themselves to create a plant or massings for buildings. Uh, schematically, over the landscape, you could use multiple types of field algorithms organized like a constellation in a point cloud, how multiple buildings would be configured uh, in relationship to each other based on axes. Um, if you look at very ancient architecture, Teotihuacan, of Khan, Angkor Wat, or sort of throughout um, human history, axes and the sort of alignment and ob of objects within space is sort of the main means in which we organize our cities. So if we're using algorithms to schematically diagram um, relationships of points and volumes and enclosures, that's the way in which we could build virtual worlds and um, cities as well. Um, so those become the underlying organizational system on which we can place uh, buildings and design. Uh, so this, this structure uh, is um, a geospatial repository. Um, it's where within the Nexus Terraforma, you would be able to organize and assimilate digital twins. Uh, so each rung, like on a bicycle spoke, you'd have a different portal into a different city on planet Earth or a different community in a different part of the world. And within this sort of dial, like a a compass or an atlas, you would be able to navigate the multiple simulations of the earth and sort of portal between them and have this type of library where you could access um, the earth system information. And along each spoke would be an exhibition or a gallery space which would give you information that pertains to uh, that given area. Um, and so this is occupied within the virtual world, massive structure. Um, inside of it would be something like this with, you would have your sort of robot avatar to be a little more playful. Um, and then be able to navigate between multiple maps and holograms of these different earth simulations and at the end have a type of green screen portal into these different environments. Um, and so this, this one structure that 
uh, simulate Earth system data would be in contact with other structures as well. Um, so then uh, certain points I've been making about um, geometry and morphology be distilled into sort of geometric systems often found in crystallography, uh, which, which allow us to manage complexity and the method in which certain geometric systems or architectures grow and evolve. Um, so as you can see, I'm sort of oscillating both between the virtual world and the um, sort of real life architecture uh, by using abstract geometry, which has a certain potential within it to become many things um, without so much being attached to what it is quite yet. And, and uh, being very excited about and acknowledging the potential of geometry to become many things. If you look at many of the, uh, the Taj Mahal or churches around the world, uh, they use construction geometry. And uh, even in deconstructivism, uh, descriptive geometry was the means to arrive at architectural form. So abstract geometry before material is a very legitimate way to arrive at architecture. And in crystallography, what you have is sort of axes of symmetry that can be categorized, uh, color-coded, um, certain radial schemes that can be offset from each other or instead of on each other. Um, and what you find is that a lot of architecture is made this way, but still is biology, meant sort of cellular subdivision of biology and crystallography as well. Um, so I did a series of explorations on what could be um, this, this sort of architectonic morphological language that you arrive at from these uh, schematic geometries, uh, which are continuously adapting, mutating, um, evolving into different forms based off the sort of tectonic system that follows the geometry. Uh, so, so from that underlying grid, there's seemingly infinite amount of possibility of forms you could generate between uh, sort of snowflakes or crystals or me uh, mechatronic forms. And then following these sort of new, new forms of um, mathematical geometries all the way through into sort of fractal algorithms and how they create a type of sacred space. And uh, sacred space as derived from sacred geometry or algorithmic forms becomes, I, I think, sort of the, the apex of these computational designs. If you look at the, the, the Taj Mahal or um, any of these really robust sacred spaces, they use underlying mathematical forms traditionally to, to govern their assembly. And computation is only going to it enable us in a deeper way to use those sort of formulations. Um, so I have some uh, animations for you. Um, so this is, oops, I opened this up. Okay, we could start that over. No one got to see it. Um, so these these algorithms, like I was previously saying, have an infinite potential to become many forms, many ways of subdividing, multiplying, and iterating upon themselves. And it, it's sort of restricted to this ambiguous fractal software right now. But I see this only as sort of the the dawn of something really amazing where we can use mathematical formulas to um, maybe grow architecture or um, see how it might assimilate itself in relationship to a data scape if it's all being 
calculated and it's all very um, sort of surreal. But what, I, what I'm discovering in these fractal spaces is a type of way where each component has a relationship with the whole. There's no transformation happening on any scale that doesn't affect in repercussions the entirety of the system. And if we're thinking about this on environmental scale, that becomes a really powerful sentiment that sort of nothing, nothing changes without impacting the whole. Um, of course, those are abstract terms. Um, and as you'll sort of see in later, I'm sort of planning on what, what these structures might look like as uh, sort of built architecture, um, translating these meshes into um, a, 3D, a 3D model that could be built from. Um, that's sort of hinting towards the future of what I plan on exploring right now. They are uh, simply digital illustrations or simulations of potential architecture. Um, so even before I discovered this fractal software, I was trying to emulate how these crystalline algorithms could become architecture, uh, but simply doing it manually, going in and modeling each column and uh, arriving at the most complex tectonic uh, one, one could have where there's this sort of underlying system uh, governing the entirety of the building. Um, this cathedral project um, sort of tackled the idea of how you would create an architecture from these underlying fractal geometries. And what is the, what is what impact does that have in terms of how you feel inside the space? Um, what what's the sort of material phenomena and um, what type of um, impact does that have on your peace of mind and the wellness of your heart. And then later discovering within sort of the fractal landscape, how these forms can be generated in alternative ways where I'm not modeling every column in a manual way, but using a mathematical formula that black box actually hidden within the software to generate these patterns and arriving at these incredible sort of vistas, um, large expansive environments that are entirely generated by formulas. Um, and then currently um, postulating, predicting that between the ability to calculate and simulate mathematical formulas like this, but then also, as you saw at the beginning of the lecture, assimilate the earth in a type of computational environment, um, simulating it as LIDAR scans or geospatial maps. Um, we're, we're arriving at a, a sort of different sort of paradigm of computational architecture that's both environmental parametric, and parametric, also algorithmic. Um, so definitely at the fringes of uh, What's, what's actually happening in practice versus what's being explored. These sort of fractal algorithms can be uh, assimilated into modules and sort of mold uh, components that could be uh, assembled, assembled into a house. Or I'm still exploring the potential of these forms, um, bringing them out of the fractal software uh, and into the more traditional modeling softwares. Um, I, find, I find that these forms are provocative to display a certain capacity of the computer that may not have been discovered yet, uh, to create a certain type of pattern and cohesion that just, and level of complexity that just hasn't been found before. 
um, and on multiple scales, either at, at the scale of the ornament or at the scale of what something that looks infrastructural like a metabolist architecture in Japan. Um, and so uh, as a sort of case study, I plan on building a physical model um, of sort of this algorithmic terrain and sort of uh, fractal building. This I see as a monastery um, in a desert uh, and the specifics have yet to be clearly articulated. I don't wanna improvise too much during this lecture, but this is, this is sort of hinting at what I'm gonna do in the near future is build, build something like this. And that's, that's the end of my lecture and I appreciate you guys also listening so much. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I could uh, con contrast it with uh, the word ecology. Um, ecology, I see, is like uh, sort of agents interacting with each other, individual organisms having their own sense of. Uh, agency and then they sort of interact with each other in a type of agent-based way or actor-based way. So sorry, I see environment as this sort of surrounding and the term environment as the surround. So when we generate these uh, context models, it, it's what's surrounding the architecture. And I find this relationship of the agent within the environment, sort of the, the architecture's relationship with the context, really amazing. And sort of oscillating between that that the relationship of individuals or the relationship of individual agents within the ecology and their surroundings. Yes. So can you can you talk about that structure that has the total and you mentioned the app part of you also mentioned the word, like, I was wearing, and I don't think you use this. Is it um, like the act, the act of in this world, or is it like the um, kind of all encompassing, like, equality of access to this data? What's most important? Uh, to what if I use this as opposed to the different? Um, a, a couple of things come to mind. What what might be um, immediately more enticing is that these digital twins are a gamified space, so it's the game engine simulation, and it's not going to be a sort of a lidar scan like Google Earth. It, and you could travel there with your friends also, so it becomes this kind of interactive way. And if these models are being developed by the community, then it becomes Sort of a multi-layered information rich simulation that you're diving into that's that's not just graphic and not just surface level but has actual uh, like rich attributes of information there's also i know um you know in, in these sort of developing communities people don't have much access to transportation so this is their opportunity to explore and interact with environments they just don't normally have access to. Um, and also, um, yeah, I think, I think it's an opportunity to sort of uh, have a community space. Uh, I see people interacting with their avatars within this, um, within this structure. Um, also, I think people want to have agency. If uh, there's so many voices who would love to voice their opinion about what they want to see in their community. And if there is a place where you could maybe portal in and leave a comment or even adjacent to the portal, leave a proposal. Um, there's so many students creating designs right now that don't, those designs don't get used. They just end up in the kind of uh, deep archive of the internet and no one sees them. Um, but maybe if they're in prox, if you're making uh, community specific proposals, um, 
right, then uh, you, you might have a solution for your neighborhood and someone can see that, um, invest in it and support it. Or you could simply say, I want this person to bring in this type of transformation. Uh, so hopefully we, be, we build some type of interface where people are adding that, adding to the data sets and within this structure contributing to uh, those different portals and what's being presented around them. Like in, like in this space where multiple avatars are sort of making comments and interacting with it. Um, it really becomes collective and everybody having access to this, these simulations and having a commentary that surrounds it. Maybe you could even call it like um, a different discourse that happens within this space that, that the community starts having within the virtual world. I think that's empowering too. It empowers the community to, um, when they have agency, therefore step up to the plate with, with an opportunity to have impact. Which is anyone, is there other questions? Uh, I want, I'll get to everyone. So. <laughs> you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is the virtual community action planning sort of process. It's a great question. I appreciate the question because it's 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 at, it's at what what point within the design process can the community get involved? And I think it's at all 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 of these sort of phases. Like at each one you mentioned, I wouldn't exclude any of them. But um, if if there's a certain protocol within the laboratory uh, to um, do an environmental analysis uh, and people are contributing to that data, that's a place for agency. If there is an identification of key locations, cultural locations, sort of what's happening within the city, that's a place for agency, for the community to voice, or where, where's the apex of the problem set within the area. Um, and then choosing what, what data is being feeded into an algorithm that's that's also where agency happens. And then simply uh, entering into the game space and communicating with your fellow uh, community members within your own site and simply talking about um, what's happening there. Um, art and architecture always has a culture surrounding it. And that's sort of where the magic happens is everyone talking with each other and making decisions that way. So hopefully this provides certain catalysts for that. And you, you had a question? This one? Oh, um, yeah. How long do you have an idea? You play um it's easier than it seems i'll say <laughs> um it's it's a pro it's a software called mandible 3d and they have preset formulas that you use i only use about seven formulas about eight parameters per formula and you could the software allows you to stitch together the formulas you simply keyframe uh certain moments of 
the parameter settings. So you could have maybe uh, sort of different, like six different settings and animate between those changing settings. Um, it's a mysterious software to me. I definitely see it. Uh, what I would like to see if I were to speculate sort of a procedure with this software would be how geospatial technology relates to these uh, fractal meshes and how we, we can sort of uh, let um, these formulas disperse themselves on onto the landscapes in a type of intelligent way based off data we feed it. Um, an idea. Yeah, Mandelbulb 3D. Yeah. Sorry, it took so long to get to you. Um, I usually I say art, I would rather not define architecture, but simply explore its capacities, right? And say that an architect can only do this or a landscape architect can only do that. And then really say that there's a certain, we, we should be always expanding the scope of impact and, and also give agency to everyone as seeing them as having the potential to contribute. Um, so these, these are new tools. There's a history of new geometer tools across like, um, but I think the, the, the main statement about what's the new role of the designer is when we have tools to simulate environments and ecologies that we become re responsible to interact with those data sets. Um, we, we become a certain transparency about what these environmental and ecological models tell us, we become responsible to uh, respond to those data sets and those narratives of what's happening at, at the level of the biosphere and in the community, those things can no longer be neglected and ignored. Um, and, and your design process, if documented on a blockchain, is going to have a ledger or some type of method in which you say, I, I included these parameters, I included these variables, and this is how I was sensitive to the situation of the environmental environmental model because there's lots of projects that happen colonially or uh, from top-down design where there's large budgets and not much impact happens so if we have a, a, a simulation that's documenting how uh, these community impact projects are being deployed then there's a certain responsibility involved I, I would like to say that the designer, with, with what I've talked about, how the design, the agency of the designer changes, they become, and use the question, they become environmental. They're concerned with their surroundings. How is this affecting the culture? How is this affecting um, sort of the, the living beings in that site? How, how is this looked at in a type of holistic way where the targeted area is a holistic problem and it's not one building that doesn't consider the impact on the surroundings. Um, and how also it, it gets the designers to work together when we use a shared context model, how do multiple projects communicate with each other and sort of create a symbiotic relationship where they're uh, co-functioning, relating to each other, sort of having multiple performances. You can think of schools and parks having simultaneous purposes or museums, libraries, and schools having all simultaneous purpose or a type of reforestation and affordable housing project. I, I hope that by visualizing codependency within data state, um, we, 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 could, we could have that different sort of agent um, where we're working together to sort of solve problems holistically and in a sort of integrated way. Um, the, the environmental degradation and the social degradation you see across these, they're an entangled problem. It's the same thing, they're not separate things. And so these affordable housing projects, these greenification projects, um, all these really great uh, 
community development projects that are happening sort of in isolated spaces can be integrated within a shared virtual tool set. And that's everyone working together on environmental issues. And the environment becomes the subject on which you could think of career technical education or multiple uh, sort of career avenues converging on this uh, model simulation space. So if you're studying botany, if you're studying materials, if you're studying genetic engineering, if you're studying sociology, it's, it's, you can sort of share a context model and sort of have those data sets stacked on uh, sort of one subject, which is the targeted area of the environment. It's a good it's a good question because architecture sits in between art and sort of utility. Um, and if we have large data sets that allow architecture to be a functional utility in new ways, then um, we also have to still like embrace our artist side, right? So um, I, I would say it's about priorities. Can we do both at the same time? I've seen really great architects talk about when they build a house, um, you know, being very pragmatic and practical, but artful at the same time. And that's just the challenge of the architect is to be both pragmatic and practical and artful at the same time. Um, not to say you can't make a sculpture or memorial or, you know, there's certain, within different communities, there's all sorts of cultural arts that they have. And art is, pertains to their identity, their way of life. Um, their self-expression, and um, that has to be respected. It's even valuable. Um, it's irreplicable, but singular to a location until we have, you know, generic everything ever. <laughs> so um, what's exciting between the two questions within the uh, portaling between the digital twins and taking art from different cultures is you could see sort of different communities using each other's artistic languages in different spaces. So maybe it's maybe it's a it's a it's an African tribal pattern showing up in London. <laughs> if 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 there's a if there's some type of dialogue between the two spaces. That's exciting. what what becomes international dialogue about uh, ecological restoration of the earth when when we have these simultaneous digital twin simulations happening. I hope I answered these questions well, but if there's any more, I'm happy to keep talking. And if, if, the, if the questions didn't satisfy you, feel free to elaborate. <laughs> okay, thanks.
like we need people to care about architectural space. And I think what's really interesting about this, because Henry and I were just saying that essentially like the book is dead. Like even if the greatest architect in the world constitutes a wrote a book or just an architecture, extremely unlikely that people have to <coughs> this one market would ever read it, no matter how I think they were. But in this situation, let's say 10 or 20 years from now, it's really interesting to imagine like a video game generation, like participating and like witnessing like possible spatial transportation occurring in the community and becoming like educated about like contemporary architecture. And it, instead of it existing in this niche website or, or you know conversation that we have today, it's becoming like publicly on display for the general public. And um, so I, I see this as like possibly this like uh, terra, uh, nexus terra forma. I see it as like empowering people to participate in the design, but also to like participate in like almost like patriotic way, like educating them about like architecture, not directly, but being involved. Right, I think that's a completely legitimate comment. If we want to truly see built environments um, transform, there has to be collective enrollment, collective uh, passion. M many people have to get involved and inspired to see this sort of uh, value of the built environment where they can express themselves, have sort of certain values reflected to themselves. Um, the journey of the artist to discover what is meaningful to them and then sort of travel to whatever dimensions to deliver it um, may not be a, a calling for, for everyone, but there's huge sort of artistic audience, audiences and it's a matter of sort of who has access to, 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 deliver, to deliver something like that. Who, because not everyone has the opportunity to follow their quest to transform the environment, but maybe everyone has a laptop in the future and can log on to a certain world where they can upload their drawings, whether it's sort of graffiti or whether it's sort of graphic design. Say, hey, I think this could be a building and someone else picks it up and just says, I want to do it here on this parcel. Or there's maybe a Discord for um a, like a community and there's a whole conversation that surrounds it this is definitely something we want to work towards and move towards is how do you create a culture where it's it's maybe popular or there's some in, that's why the incentive question asked before is so important is how do you get sort of a more massive culture of circulating around the development of the community we still need certain leaders who are more invested in doing that, but it also takes takes everyone to sort of carry out that transformation. Um, I hope to see the physiognomy or the physical built environment transform, and I've reverse engineered it in this multiple ways. And what you're saying is completely true. We need sort of every every person on deck to. Uh, contribute to these uh, trans uh, tr visions and transformations within the digital space. Um, and that's, I completely have faith that uh, we'll see that transformation happen. Thank you.